Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. My name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus College, which you can see behind me in, in somewhat sunnier times. We are recording this event for people who can't make it to join us today. Now, Jesus College itself is ancient. We were originally a 12th century nunnery and have been a college of the University of Cambridge since 1496. The Intellectual Forum itself, however, is far more recent. We were set up four years ago to get people to think and talk about important issues and to reach outside the boundaries of our own historic college. We've had many stellar speakers from around the world. A few highlights have included fashion designer Jimmy Chu, former New Zealand Prime Minister and leader of the um, United Nations Development Programme, Helen Clark, the director of NASA's Deep Space X-ray Observatory, Belinda Wilkes, and many, many more. We've also shown off some of the transformational work being done by many of our own academics, from using new synthetic biology techniques to come up with a completely new, safe, clean way of dyeing clothes, to experiments with the coldest things in the universe that are actually even colder than outer space. If you missed any of these events, many of them are on YouTube on our channel there, so you can catch up and see some of the amazing experiences that we've had. Throughout this week, though, we're looking at a crucially important issue that affects all of us, sleep. Most people don't sleep enough, and this has huge consequences for us. When we're lacking sleep, we don't concentrate, we have worse moods, we're more likely to be unwell, whether from heart attacks or cancer. People who had only a few hours sleep the night before driving are as likely or more likely to be involved with a fatal car crash as those who had just passed the drink drive limit. We've taken great strides to stamp out drink driving. Most of us would not go in a car with somebody drunk. But when did you last ask if the driver of a car you get into had actually slept the night before? And sleep deprivation has a huge economic cost. Economists at Rand Europe estimate it costs about 40 billion pounds to the UK just from lack of sleep. Just imagine what we could be doing with an extra 40 billion pounds every year. So we've put together a whole week of events to look at this, starting with today's event with Professor Helen Ball, and you'll hear a bit more about that obviously in a second. And then tomorrow we have Jessica Toe and Erin Flynn Evans from the baby tracking and sleep improvement app Huckleberry. So if you want to understand how to get babies to sleep better, come along to that. On Tuesday, we're looking at mental and physical health with clinical psychologist, Dr. Michael Gradner, who's an internationally recognized expert in sleep health. What does happen to us when we don't sleep very well? On Thursday, we're coming back to look at technology and how it can help to understand and improve sleep. Sleep Cycle has become the world's richest repository of data on global sleep habits. We'll be learning from them what they found out and what that should tell us that we can do with our lives. And then on Friday, we're gonna hear about the economic consequences from Michael Whitmore, research leader at RAND Europe. So it's a really varied collection of events, but all look at that crucial issue, sleep. I'm delighted to be working with the university's Think Lab program on a number of these projects, particularly because uh, their manager, the wonderful Dr. Tyler Shaws, is also one of our own senior research associates at the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus. But it's been a great pleasure as ever to work with Tyler. So it's an amazing week ahead of us. And I'd now like to hand over to the Deputy Director of the Intellectual Forum, Dr. Sarah Steele, because it was her idea and her vision to have this entire week on such an important issue. Sarah, over to you to run us through today's event. Thanks so much, Julian. Of course, as Julian said, I'm Dr. Sarah Steele. I am the Deputy Director of the Intellectual Forum and a Senior Research Associate in Public Health here at Cambridge. I'm absolutely delighted today to be able to talk to Professor Helen Ball. Professor Ball is the Professor of Anthropology and Director of Durham University's Infancy and Sleep Centre. She pioneered really the study of infant sleep and the parent-infant sleep relationship from a biosocial perspective. She established in 2000 the Parent-Infant Sleep Lab at the university 
and she particularly researches and examines sleep ecology and infants and looks also at their parents' attitudes and practices regarding infant sleep. She looks at the behavioral and physiological interactions of infants and their parents during sleep, um, infant sleep development, and the discordance between the cultural and biological sleep needs that are there. So she's done lots of research in different settings, in hospitals, in her sleep lab, in the community, in different places to kind of contribute to and understand at the international and national policy levels um, and different practice guidelines on infant care. In um, 2016, she was appointed the chair of the scientific committee for the Lullaby Trust and in 2018, um, Durham University received the Queen's Anniversary Prize for Further and Higher Education for Helen's research and outreach work. She's had many important roles. She's a board member of the International Society for the Study and Prevention of Infant Deaths. She's an assessment board member for the UNICEF's UK Baby Friendly Initiative. And of course, she runs a range of different things. We've mentioned the Durham Infancy and Sleep Centre, but also the Baby Sleep Information Source basis. So, Thank you, Helen, for joining us today. It would be great. Yes, video is on, wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful to have you. Um, I know you circulated around a video of a previous lecture that you had given last year, which was absolutely wonderful. I'm well aware that not all the caregivers here may have had time to watch it, knowing our lockdown situation. So I just thought to kick off before people start asking questions using the Q&A function, which you all can find at the bottom of your screen, you can ask Helen any question you want around the topic of today. But just to get us started, I wanted to kind of throw out there, what would be your one take home message for caregivers about infant sleep following on from your talk? Okay, great. Well, thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, and it's great to be here. Um, Really our take on, on what is normal infant sleep stems from the fact that babies are born in a particular set with a set, set of particular biological expectations as a result of our evolutionary history. You know, that we're mammals, we're precocial mammals, we're hominins and all of those things have affected um, birth, reproduction and um, the state in which human infants are born. And Babies are particularly helpless. Um, human babies are unusually helpless, yet they have the characteristics of what we call precocial mammals. So they require frequent feeding. Um, they require contact and comfort from their parents. Um, they're not designed to be left in a nest and parked for long periods, et cetera. Um, they're designed to, to be a, a carrying following. We are a carrying following kind of species in terms of our biology. And so what, babies expect to happen to them at night time is ends up being really quite different from the the cultural and historical kind of recent narrative around infant sleep in our society um, so we end up in a situation where there's a mismatch between what babies are biologically expecting and what parents are expecting to provide for them or are expecting their babies to want or need um, and a lot of our research has been around documenting this mismatch, understanding what try or trying to understand what parents think's going on, um, understand how they cope with that, think about the implications for babies of the different strategies that parents might use to cope with their baby's biological needs, and try to somehow reconcile the two and help parents to find a way forward during what can be a really quite stressful and anxiety provoking time. So Helen, you mentioned there that there's often a mismatch. What would you say is the current kind of prevailing narrative and why do you think that's so mismatched from the description you've just given of the infant's needs? So over the last 50 or 60 years or so, the um, the common view, the public view, and the view of many pediatricians and, and other health professionals about infant sleep is that, is that they need their parents to teach them to sleep. And if we get that right and we start teaching our babies how to sleep from an early age, then sleep becomes this gradual progression where babies will do more and more of their sleep at night. It'll be less fragmented. 
um, and they'll start sleeping through the night from about three months of age and then it just gets better and better and parents can expect their babies to kind of like uh, not need them in the night. Um, but unfortunately that's not how babies are biologically made um, and so when parents get that you know parents know that babies are going to be wakeful for the first couple of months but when they get to about three months of age and the baby that they have is not doing what the baby in the books um, they've read about would do or that their mom or their mother-in-law says says you know they did or their partner did at that age um, they begin to get anxious that there's something wrong with their baby or they're doing something wrong. Um, and this is what the mismatch is all about. Um, that, things, that things change over time, our ideas and our infant care practices change over time. Um, the way in which the expectations that we place upon parents and the expectations that we place upon babies has changed considerably over time. Um, but the, 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 the most common narrative 20 years ago it was all about give baby a bottle of formula and, and that will help it sleep longer. Um, obviously the, cl the, the, the climate of breastfeeding promotion has changed a lot in the last 20 years. And some parents are now um, accepting that a breastfed baby is not gonna sleep um, you know, for long periods of time because they need to be fed frequently during the night and during the day. Um, but they are expecting that at some point there's this switch when it changes and babies are gonna start sleeping through the night. And many babies don't, and that comes as quite a shock. Um, and so thinking about the way in which we talk to parents about sleep, um, you know, we, we're forever asking new parents whether their baby's sleeping through the night yet, as if that is a really important milestone that those babies should be achieving. Um, and that's, it's, it's a way in which parents feel as though they're being judged in their parenting. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, it makes, it, it can make, not it doesn't always, but it can make the whole experience much more stressful. Okay, so we have two questions that have popped up that have gone effectively to those kind of questions of what our caregivers asking, what is kind of normal? Is it, how do I get my three month old to wean off of night feeds? Is this a good time to do it? Do they need to be all, um, older? Is it normal for babies to sleep shorter amounts? Could you comment perhaps on what is, normal if anything at all I know many of us watched your talk but for those who didn't so there are many definitions of normal and this was really how I began the talk mm -hmm. and I divided it into three things there are there's biologically normal there's culturally normal and the statistically normal uh, culturally normal is what the is what the, the the general kind of climate of opinion is saying about babies and 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 this is still dominated by babies should be able to sleep through the night from three months of age and give your baby formula if it's not settling because that formula when some heavy substance in it like baby rice or cereal will help it to sleep through the night and you know etc um, statistically normal is about the averages that that you find in the baby books and the charts on the clinic walls they know you know babies at this age should be getting this much sleep and at that age should be getting that much sleep. And we need to remember that those are averages and averages um, um, disguise a huge range that lies behind them. And some babies need more sleep than others. And so to, in terms of total amounts of sleep, a baby might be completely normal at either end of those ranges, but doesn't sit anywhere near the average. Um, and then biologically normal means you know, for a, for a baby who is breastfed, because that is what babies are born expecting to, to receive is their mother's milk. So for a breastfed baby um, who is developing typically, you would expect them to digest, you know, a full human milk feed in a couple to three hours. So they're gonna be waking again and expecting to feed in that time period. Um, in terms of night weaning, I would say um, if you're intending to breastfeed for at least six months, which is the current recommendation in the UK, then I would not consider night weaning at three months because what you are very likely to find is that as soon as your baby stops feeding at night, um, your milk supply starts to plummet because we need regular milk removal in order to make milk as mothers. Um, and we need the prolactin surges to kind of keep our, our milk supply going. Um, so I would say if, you, if you're thinking of night weaning um, and 
it, it's better to, to not do that until you're close to six months. Um, five hours, then three hours, yeah. then one and a half hours each night. Um, yes, so babies' night waking patterns can be very variable. Um, there's, there's a bit of a, an assumption that once babies start to consolidate uh, sleep cycles together into blocks, which is often referred to as settling or consolidation, um, that that will just keep progressing and those blocks will get bigger and bigger and bigger. But it doesn't happen like that. Babies will consolidate a couple of blocks for a while and then they'll go back to waking more frequently again. So it's, I find likening it more to a roller coaster in terms of how much babe, sleep babies are gonna get during the night and how long their sleep bouts are gonna be um, is more realistic than thinking of it as kind of like a gradual incline. So we've had another question, Helen, which is pertaining to um, a 14 month old uh, who's frequently waking up and people are telling her that that's likely to be affecting the child and that something's wrong. Could you kind of reflect on how there are, is this diversity that you mentioned in your talk? Yes, um, so children who are kind of past the year of, past the age of the first year, um, who are still being breastfed at night are still likely to um, wake, um, to feed um, during the night because that's what they're used to. And it does eventually, they do eventually stop doing it. If you, you know, parents can, parents can initiate it, but if parents don't want to initiate it, they want to let it be a baby led thing then babies do eventually stop doing it, but it might take them until the second year or even the third year before they're ready to do that. Um, in terms of um, is, is the mother doing something wrong? Well, uh, what I suspect is going on and that she, you know, why she knows how frequently her baby is waking during the night is because she's sleeping close to her. And we do know more about what our babies are doing at night when we sleep close to them than when even if they're just in a separate cot in our room but you know many babies by a year old might be in a cot in their own room and those babies do wake as, as frequently they do wake several times in the night but parents are usually fast asleep when they do it so they're not aware of the fact that their babies are waking so when you're breastfeeding your baby and you're you're sleeping next to it you're more likely to be aware of that um, so I would say it's very likely that your baby is not doing anything different than anybody else's baby. You're just more aware of it. And so that leads to one of my questions for you. We've seen the rise of technological approaches to sleep. So we've seen the rise of apps where we sleep track. We're seeing things like the Snoo Cot. One of my friends just got one for her infant that's telling you how the child's sleeping, when they're sleeping, how long they're sleeping and monitoring them with an AI driven approach. What do you think about that? Is it helpful? Is it harmful? What do you think generally? I don't think it does the baby any harm because the baby's probably completely unaware of all of the, the stuff that you're monitoring. But I think for parents who have a tendency towards anxiety, it can be you know, really detrimental because it makes you worry about every little thing. Um, and there's no benchmark against which um, to, to measure those things because this technology is so new. So there's, you know, there's not a, there's not a cultural history of, oh yes, well, when babies are monitored this closely, it look, their sleep looks like this. Um, we're still only just um, seeing research using actigraphs for babies and, and being able to get an objective sense of their sleep patterns for the, ma the vast majority of the studies that have been done historically on infant sleep have just been done by parents reports and so they're you know they're very subjective and when we compare actigraphy data with parents reports they're hugely uh, um, disparate so what parents are experiencing and what babies are experiencing are really you know quite a long way apart so somebody has actually followed up with a question here that's really relevant. How can we balance that infant biological need to sleep close to their parents with concerns about the safety of bed sharing? That's one that I have really spent a lot of time working on. So that's one of been one of our core areas of interest um, in our lab. Um, it was the question that really um, got me interested in, in this area of research 
because um, to me as an anthropologist and everything that I knew about kind of babies evolutionary history and other primates and cross-cultural studies suggested that where babies most expected to be was right there next to their mom at night. Um, and yet at the time when I started all of this research, that was exactly what parents were being told not to do. So we wanted to find out what were parents doing? Were they bringing their babies into bed with them regardless of what they were being told? And if they weren't, what was happening? Um, so what we found was that about 50% of mums and dads were bringing their babies into bed at night in the first three months um, because they were figuring out that this was a useful strategy to cope with night feeds or to calm their baby and settle their baby, et cetera. And it works for some parents. It doesn't work for all parents, but it certainly works for a large proportion. So they were doing it anyway, regardless of what they'd been told, but they were, um, they were not telling their health professional that they were doing it. Um, because they felt that they were going to get told off about it. Um, and as more research was done, um, it became more and more obvious that it's not the baby being next to the parent that is the issue. It is the context in which that is happening that can make it more dangerous or less dangerous. So over the last um, seven or eight years, um, it's become clear from a big um, NICE review that was done that issued new guidance on SIDS and co-sleeping for the UK and studies that have taken place in um, the UK epidemiologically that have illustrated that there are certain key things that increase the risks of bed sharing and these are sleeping on a sofa with a baby is the, is the, the most dangerous thing and this was the one this was the place where parents ended up when they were trying not to bed share um, because you know because babies wake in the night and they need feeding in the night and they need settling in the night and um, if you can't take your baby into bed with you because people have told you that that's going to increase the risk you might go sit downstairs on the couch to feed your baby and you end up accidentally falling asleep and so the the number of deaths of babies that happened on sofas increased so sofa sharing is one, um, sleeping with a baby in the context of having consumed drugs and alcohol is another, sleeping with a parent who's a smoker is another, and sneaking, sleeping with a baby who was born prematurely is another. And those are the really the key things, the key places where um, co-sleeping is, is hazardous and parents should think very carefully about whether they want to take the risk of co-sleeping under those circumstances. Um, but, but otherwise the risks are really quite minimal and especially for the for breastfed babies whose risks of SIDS are low in the first place and whose mothers have this kind of um, awareness of where their baby is while they're asleep, um, then the, you know, you're, you're, you're balancing a very small risk against you know, whatever the benefits are of doing that. So, for many parents, for particularly for breastfeeding mums, bringing the baby into bed um, outweighs the very small risk of SIDS. Okay, so somebody else asked to follow up on that about the back to sleep campaign. So we've talked about where the baby's sleeping, but the question here is about how the baby is sleeping, um, with some babies being far more settled sleeping on their tummies or chest to chest with a caregiver, for example. Um, as a parent, this particular individual had reflected that they find sleeping like that feels instinctual and normal. Have studies looked at the safety around sleeping on the chest, um, chest to chest that way? And what, what is the evidence there? So the short answer is no, they haven't. The data about the um, safety of being on the baby's back and the, and the increased chance of SIDS when the baby is placed prone is all about when babies sleep on their own in cots. It's not about babies who are sleeping on parents' chests. So, so the, the, increase, um, the increase in SIDS was, was predominantly babies who were placed face down in their cots. Um, so people have not separated out whether any of those babies um, who died in the prone position were actually on their parents' chest. Um, but it's, it's very... It, it would, if, if they were, it would be a very small proportion because they would also be um, part of the bed sharing. They would be classed as, as bed sharing as well. 
Um, so in terms of what we say about the safety of babies sleeping on their parents' chest, it's fine if the parent's awake. So if the parent's monitoring the baby, if they're making sure that it hasn't got its chin kind of slumped down on its chest, its airways are clear, it's had its chins up and its airways are clear, then so long as they're monitoring them, it's fine. The problem becomes when the parent falls asleep because when you fall asleep, you lose hold of your baby as tightly and babies do slide off. And then it's not a SIDS issue, it's a suffocation or accidental death issue because the baby's ending up next to you on a cushion or wedged against something or whatever. So if, the, if there's a danger or a risk of you falling asleep um, with the baby on your chest, then it's best to have somebody else present to kind of keep an eye on you. Um, and if you're by yourself, then I would say it's, it's the safest thing to do is to try and put your baby down flat on its back, not leave it on your chest while you fall asleep. So we also had another follow-up question there that talked about premature babies. You mentioned the risk for premature babies. Somebody has asked how long that lasts and what um, age should parents start being able to bring a baby who was born premature into bed? We don't know. We don't know because the data aren't detailed enough to be able to portion, portion uh, premature babies into age groups and look at whether they had an increased risk or not when they were bed sharing. There's just a data set that includes some premature babies and those premature babies were at increased risk at the time they were, um, you know, the, the, the age they were when, when they died or the control groups were, you know, in, in the peak age for SIDS. After they've passed that age, there, are, there aren't enough of them to be able to make a comparison. So we can't say that there is, and, and of course, it's going to vary based on what the baby's gestational age was when it was born. So we can't slice the data up finely enough in order to say, well, if the baby was kind of like 32 weeks and then it's gonna be fine after it's X number of months, but if it was 28 weeks, then it's gonna to have to wait until, you know, it just isn't possible to do that. The data just aren't detailed enough. So unfortunately, although it's a question that I get asked every time I give a talk, I've never been able to give a straight answer to it because there isn't one. Okay, so somebody asked a very contemporary question, which I feel has a good point right now about whether there's been an increase in SIDS during COVID. Are we seeing differences in the data? As, to the best of my knowledge, and I've not been collecting the data on this, but I know that the data have been being collected and I've heard a report from, um, from the folks at Bristol who have been collecting it and they say, no, there hasn't, there hasn't been an increase during COVID. Okay, and somebody else has followed up with a question about, you mentioned about sofas um, and the increased risk of SID when sleeping on the sofa. How does that risk actually manifest? E.g., is it when they're lying next to the parent, the parent's sitting upright with the baby, they're, they're asking a question about what do you mean there about being on the sofa with the child? It's ex it, the answer to that is exactly the question, the, the answer to, um, to the premature baby question is that nobody has ha, has been able to tease that data apart enough. So in, in SIDS case control studies, they're basically quite a blunt instrument for looking at this because you've got to be able to count stuff and put it into categories. So you've got, you, 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 you've got a category of babies who have died and a category of matched babies who haven't died. And then you're counting how many of those babies were on a sofa. How many of those babies were in a cot by themselves? How many of them were in a cot on their backs or on their fronts? So for the ones who were in a sofa, what people have looked at is, were the parents under the influence of drugs and alcohol? Um, and were the parents smokers? That's pretty much it. They haven't looked at, was the baby on the parent's chest or placed on the parent's chest or placed at the other end of the sofa or, you know, were the, was the parents sitting up or were the parents lying down? That level of detail hasn't been explored. And usually when it hasn't been explored, it's because there is not a big enough group in any one category to be able to, to do that kind of analysis. Um, so the, the one thing that we do know about sofas is that the, the babies who die um, with a parent on a sofa, it's not just SIDS. 
it's SIDS and it's accidental deaths. And sometimes you can't distinguish between the two. So if a baby has slipped down between a parent and the cushions and has been come entrapped, then it tends to be recorded as an accidental death because it is assumed that that baby, um, you know, had its chest compressed or its airways covered and it couldn't breathe. Um, but, you know, there might be circumstances where something like that's happened, but the parents rolled away and pulled the baby back onto them and not realized um, that it had, you know, stopped breathing or for instance. So when a death scene investigation is done, it's really difficult to kind of categorize exactly what happened to that baby at that time. Which is not a very nice subject to talk no. about, is babies dying in traumatic circumstances, so. No, but somebody has also asked about what it is about smoking that increases the risk of SIDS. Okay, so, so smoking's a bit different. Um, so there's two things with smoking. One is whether the baby was smoke exposed in pregnancy. So that means, you know, did the mother smoke in pregnancy? And then the other is, is the baby being um, exposed to someone who is a smoker now? So what's very clear is that babies who are smoke exposed during pregnancy have an increased risk of SIDS. Their, in, you know, their innate risk of SIDS is, is greater when they're born than a baby who's, who wasn't smoke exposed. And that goes for whether they sleep by themselves or they sleep with someone else. But if they sleep with someone else, it seems as though there's an interaction between bed sharing and having been smoke exposed that increases their risk. Now, it's very difficult to say precisely what that's about because SIDS is an unexplained death. So we don't understand why these babies die, but we do know a bit about some of the things that are common features of those babies who do die. And one of the things that's a common feature of the babies who do die is that they have a blunted arousal response and babies who are smoke exposed in pregnancy have a blunted arousal response which suggests that if they experience some kind of physiological stressor, like getting um, uh, blankets over their head, say, that, an, that an, a normal baby, non-smoke exposed baby would have been able to deal with, babies with a blunted arousal response don't wake up in response to that and try to clear their airways. Um, so that's one of the things that people have suggested is why smoke exposed babies are more at risk in the bed. That doesn't explain why smoke is uh, sleeping with a, um, a dad, for instance, who's a smoker might increase their risk. And, and some of the studies illustrate that, that that is an increased risk and some don't. So it's not particularly clear. Um, but what people suspect is that there's either something about it affects the, the smoker's sleep so that the smoker is less aware um, of where the baby is at night, or it's something to do with the, the excellence from the smoker's lungs that it includes carbon monoxide or it includes, you know, some kind of noxious substances um, that might negatively impact the baby. So I sometimes get questions from mums about um, wanting to have their baby in bed with them, but their, their partner is a smoker. And if he brushes his teeth and he has a shower before he comes to bed, is that going to take care of the fact that he's a smoker? And, you know, if it's something that's coming out of his lungs, no, it's not. Um, but we don't know that it is something that's coming out of his lungs. We can only speculate about that. But the safest thing is probably to encourage him to sleep somewhere else if the baby's going to be in bed. Okay, so, so again, a lot of a lot of not very clear answers, unfortunately. Well, that's one of the things that's kind of come up here that some people have said, um, which I want to pick up on probably on a little bit of a more positive note. But um, how there's a few questions here that go to the heart of, in light of what you're saying about different evidence and difficult to deduce things, um, we've been guided a lot about what is normal culturally, and there's a lot, especially in the sort of weird countries that you mentioned in the advertisement for this and in your lecture um, about normal infant sleep. How can we adjust parents' expectations? Um, and as a sideline to that, one of the questions further down is also about how that differs from other countries and how we can be more aware of the diversity around this. Well, I think, 
I think as a, as, a, as a group of people who talk to parents about babies and babies sleep, I think one of the things that we can do is help to, to normalize the fact that night waking, you know, is common, is frequent. It can go on for a long time um, because when you're led to believe that there's something wrong with your baby, if it does that, you feel compelled to try and fix that. And it becomes kind of, you know, a, a bit of an obsession sometimes that you've got to try everything in the book to try and get your baby to sleep. But if you have a baby who is who is not inclined or predisposed to sleep, and a, many babies go through periods like that, it can be easier for some people to accept it and go with the flow um, or to try strategies that help to kind of minimize the impact of that on you rather than trying to fix the baby. If, you know, it, it may be an impossible task to try to change the baby's sleep habits. So the way in which we talk about um, what is normal infant sleep um, and the way in which people share information about their own baby's sleep, I think could be quite different because we have a tendency to try to present our own kind of family in the best possible light. And so, you know, mothers will hear other mothers talking about how their baby, you know, goes down at seven o'clock and they don't hear a peep from it until seven in the morning. And how brilliant is that when they're, you know, they're up three or four times in the night. Um, so I think being honest about what having, what, what having a new baby is like at night would go a long way to kind of making this, normalizing this conversation. I don't do know whether you, I got to the second part of your question. Sorry, that's I'm fine. Really, but... Do you think there's a way that we can do that better and also incorporate knowledges from other cultures? Because one of the things that you sort of mentioned is that there is particular notions in these kind of Western industrialized um, situations that are a little bit different. Some people have asked, how do we get to understand more about what happens elsewhere? Can you speak a little bit as an anthropologist about what happens elsewhere and comment on it? And how can we use that to adjust expectations for people who are about to become caregivers become parents or or not or thinking about whether they could how can we how can we bring this to people's attention i mean i think i think events like this are obviously really good and that's it you know this is one of the reasons why we started the baby sleep information source was to try to bring this information into the public domain um, to help help health professionals understand it so that, that hopefully they will pass it on to the parents that they work with. Um, so we need, you know, we need stories about it in the media. We need health professionals to recognize that there's a diversity of ways of parenting babies at night. And um, it would be helpful to talk to parents about all of the different ways in which they could do it rather than being prescriptive about one. And I know many health professionals are, you know, have broadened their view in recent years. Um, some of the some of the the influences that people follow on social media have also kind of like tried to explain to parents how um, how diverse infant care practices might be around the world, etc. But there are still some very dogmatic views out there, and people will go and buy books with you know a one size fits all approach and and. believe that it's the be all and end all of, you know, night, nighttime infant care when it may not suit their baby. It, it may, but it may not. Um, so I think we have to be prepared to be flexible. Um, from, from our point of view as anthropologists, I think knowing that what we do um, in Western society is just one picture, one approach, one slice of kind of, um, one slice of a cultural way of thinking about babies and is not necessarily the, the best way to think about babies. Um, it's just a way to think about babies. Um, if we look around the world, most babies are kept in close proximity to a, a carer for, for 24 hours out of the day. They're not put down and expected to be able to kind of sustain themselves for an eight hour period at night. Um, yet we have that expectation of, of relatively small babies 
um, that they should be able to do that sometime in the first year. Uh, so I think we need to challenge those ideas, um, think about how they've come about, um, and support parents who are who are grappling with all of that because um, it, I think it's really unhelpful if you're in the middle of trying to you know um, parent responsibly, breastfeed at night, whatever it is that, that is your goal and your preference, um, for somebody to be just telling you that you shouldn't be doing it. Um, you know, I think being supportive is one of the most helpful things that we can do for new parents to understand um, and to try to, you know, offer support in, in the most practical ways that we can. So we have a lot of people asking very practically driven questions about feeding back to sleep at night, your thoughts on things like controlled crying and various different things like that. There's a few questions about the use of pacifiers or dummies. Forgive my, I, I'm an Australian who lived in America who's been in Britain. I don't even know <laughs> all it anymore. Analogy. Um, these kind of very practical things. Um, could you maybe explain a little bit around that? Because you've mentioned diversity. Are dummies good or bad things? Is controlled crying problematic or not? All of these are quite practical and applied. I know a lot of parents having, as a mum myself, stress about what I should and shouldn't do. Is there direct evidence in these or are they something you can try? I think it, it really, really depends on who you are as a parent, what your parenting values are and the way in which you want to raise your child. There are so many different approaches that you can take. There isn't one, you know, I'm completely against the idea that there's a one size fits all approach that is suitable for everybody. Um, I think Things like controlled crying can have their place in certain circumstances. I don't think that they're appropriate for babies under six months of age, um, particularly if you're trying to sustain breastfeeding to six months, which is the recommendation. Um, controlled crying means leaving your baby in a separate room and that undermines breastfeeding. It is also one of the things that increases the risk of SIDS, putting your baby to sleep by itself under the age of six months. So I wouldn't recommend doing that, but for older babies, there are certainly parents who benefit from doing it, but I think it's a balance between weighing up what is best for the baby, what is best for the parents, kind of coming to a conclusion that in balance, what is best for the, the family is to do X, Y, or Z. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell people that they should never do any of these things, but I wouldn't recommend that everybody does them either. Um, with regards to pacifiers or dummies, um, again, I think that's one of those things that's very much personal choice. Um, we know that they can undermine breastfeeding initiation. So if you're trying to initiate breastfeeding, give it a month before introducing pacifiers, that's the recommendation. Um, we know that there are some SID studies that have associated having a dummy or a pacifier with a reduced chance of SIDS. But it's not as clear cut or straightforward as that. That's the recommendation in the States. Over here, um, they did manage to disentangle the data enough to be able to say it wasn't always having a pacifier that was made the difference. It was having a pacifier if you normally had one that was protective. So babies who'd never ever had one weren't at increased risk but babies who usually used one and then didn't have one on a particular night where it was the night they were at risk. So there was, so more babies died on nights when they didn't have a pacifier when they usually would have had one versus um, babies who never had one. So it, Sorry. again, it, <laughs> again it's, it's more complicated than, than we would like it to be, um, yeah. So with that, um, in your video, you mentioned some products that are outright dangerous. Um, one of the people here has asked, what are they? Um, and somebody else, as a kind of coupling with that, has mentioned bad practices being promoted by influencers. Could you comment a little about what we know is dangerous mm -hmm. and about some of the cultural aspects of promoting those dangerous practices as well? Okay, so, so there are some, some well-known products that have been uh, taken off the market because they were found to be associated with an increased chance of 
uh, babies dying. So things like uh, there was something called a rock and play, I think, um, that, they, that, that tilted and babies would get wedged into the corner with their faces smushed in the corner um, and suffocate. So those were those were particularly dangerous. Things that in, that are that are um, very soft, squishy things in the baby's sleep environment. So bean bags, um, pillows. Um, so one of the reasons why it's recommended that babies have a clear, flat sleep surface is because historically, um, squishy products have been associated with babies, uh, both with SIDS and with suffocation. Um, what other things? So crib bumpers also come into that category. Um, people are concerned about pods and nests for the same reason. Um, I haven't seen any data on, um, they're too new um, for there to be any data on SIDS in pods and nests. Um, but people are worried about the squishiness of them both because of the, the, the fact that they enclose the baby's head. So that's an overheating risk and the fact that they're squishy um, so that's a suffocation risk. Um, things that encourage babies to sleep on their fronts um, are, are considered to be dangerous because leaving a baby unattended on its front is an acids risk. Um, and there was something else that just went in and out of my brain. Um, oh, posi position us to, to, to kind of prop babies in. Um, there are, there, are, there are some things that you can prop babies on their sides in. Um, and I can't remember what the situation was with them, but I know they're not recommended by SIDS organizations, but it's escaping me what the, what the, what the rationale for that was. And so one of the questions that's following on from that that's just popped up is at what age can you introduce the pillow and some of these soft environment things? Over a year. So SIDS rates, um, SIDS rates decline dramatically in the second half of the first year. So by the time babies are a year old, um, the pillows and, and things and soft toys aren't prohibited, but be sensible. Don't put some, you know, great big, huge bolster in with the baby and not leave it enough room to be able to kind of get itself free if it gets stuck underneath it. So we've got also a load of questions that kind of follow on because you've mentioned breastfeeding and and like if you're breastfeeding your infant a lot. So there's been several questions here about feeding babies back to sleep, mm -hmm. about weaning and things like that. Um, could you kind of set out a little bit for breastfeeding parents? What is known, if there is known to be an ideal, if it is feeding them back to sleep is going to create problems later? Or is it really something you should be, as you've kind of mentioned a few times, listening to the infant on this one and your relationship with them? I think things like feeding the baby back to sleep is, is really, um, you know, it, it, it's really a function of what kind of parent you want to be. Um, so, you know, how you view your role as a parent. And for parents who review their, view their role as being responsive and meeting their baby's needs, then feeding their baby back to sleep at night absolutely makes sense. Um, but it might mean that that nighttime feeding and bed sharing continues for longer than it does for a parent who feels as though their role is to encourage their baby to learn to settle and sleep by itself, um, which you can, you can do with persistence and it takes some effort. Um, by not feeding the baby back to sleep and, and using other techniques to calm the baby and encourage them to, to fall asleep by themselves. And it really just depends on, on what your personal kind of preference is um, for parenting style. Um, I, personally, I just, you know, I, I wanted my child to know, or both of my children, to know that I was always there if they ever needed me. And so I let them stay in the bed until they were happy to leave by themselves. But that's not for everybody, you know, so I don't want to recommend that everybody should do that. Um, but I think it, it really does depend on what your parenting kind of values are. So we have some questions for those who are parenting multiples. Um, wow. And they've asked if there's any insight on multiples and noting that the guidance is different between countries on that. And we've also got some people that have raised sleeping better when they're sharing with siblings or parents. 
Mm -hmm. Could you perhaps comment on that kind of multiples relationship and the sibling relationships um, and what we know or don't know there? Okay, so with multiples, we've done some research on that and the, and the outcome of the research that we found was that babies who slept together as infants tended to become more synchronized in their sleep patterns and the parents found them easier to, to cope with at night because they tended to wake at the same time and be fed at the same time, etc. Um, we didn't find that they were um, that they were capable of overlaying each other or of you know being a risk to one another. We found that parents, when they were very small, would put them side by side in a cot, not in a Moses basket because there's not enough space and they can't thermoregulate and cool themselves down because they can't get away from each other, but in a cot where there's enough space for them to be able to kind of lift their arms above their head and cool their bodies and all the rest of it. Then side by side when they were small seemed to work, but as they got bigger, they turned them around and put them head to head. Um, and babies would, you know, sometimes one would wake and scream and the other one would sleep completely through it. So, you know, parents are worried that they're gonna wake each other. They don't necessarily wake each other, um, but they did tend to become synchronized in their patterns. Um, so if parents want to deal with one baby at a time, then that is probably not the most effective way to do it. Maybe it would be better to have them in separate cots, but for parents who do want to deal with both babies at the same time and, and nurse them together, et cetera, then that seemed to work quite well. Um, with respect to siblings and, and sleeping with siblings and sleeping with parents, it does seem as though for some babies, this is, um, it's particularly, relaxing and calming to have another person there and they do sleep better um, but we do need to be careful with small babies and older siblings because children generally aren't very aware when they're asleep and some older siblings have overlain their their baby sibling so we always say um, to keep an adult in between a baby and another child if you have no other option it's better if you've got an older child who wants to sleep with a parent and the baby it's better to have one parent take the older child and, and another parent take the baby but if you're by yourself and you can't do that put yourself in between your baby and your older child until your baby's at least a year old and then is able to defend its own airways and has the mobility to be able to to, to get out of a, a situation where the other one's too close. So we've also got some questions about sleeping environment itself. So questions about like noise and light, should it always be quiet and dark? Should parents intervene when the child is sleeping? So one of the questions here was about turning them onto their back and things like that. What, what is it about the sleep environment? Is there any um, particular things people should do or is it about your child? So, that, that, that question depends on the baby's age um, and it also um, depends on what we're talking about. So with respect to, the, to light and dark, um, babies don't have a circadian rhythm when they're born. They've been running off of their mom's circadian cycle. So it takes them about three months to start to develop their own kind of circadian pattern, which is, you know, their hormones, cortisol peaking in the morning, melatonin peaking in the evening, and then um, them becoming entrained to kind of like daylight zeitgebers and things so that they wake in the morning and they start to get drowsy towards nighttime. So if we want to encourage their circadian rhythm to kind of um, develop strongly, exposing them to daylight in the morning is really important and not putting them in darkened rooms in the middle of the day is also important because that makes the melatonin increase and that makes the baby feel as though it's nighttime and it's got to have a big nighttime sleep in the middle of the day. So daytime naps in the busy, noisy, light daytime environment are better for the baby's circadian development. But of course, for us as moms, if they have a big nap in the middle of the day, we get to get stuff done. So the tendency is to go and stick them in the bedroom by themselves, shut the curtains, make it all quiet so that they'll sleep as long as possible. Um, 
So this is one of those other uh, examples where you've got kind of competing interests going on. It's what's best for the baby biologically to be right where the mom is with the vacuum cleaner or the washing machine going or in the car going wherever she's going or whatever. Um, but, but the mom's preference might be to be able to get a couple of hours of time without the baby. Um, so that, so that, that's the kind of thing that we need to be thinking about. Um, you know, what are the consequences of putting the baby in the darkened room for a long time in the middle of the day? Well, it might be that actually it's not establishing its circadian rhythm as quickly as it would do otherwise. It's using up its sleep pressure in the middle of the day so that when it gets to nighttime, it's not gonna take that big long sleep that it might otherwise have taken for the first portion of its sleep. Um, so everything's got consequences. They're all sort of interconnected. In terms of the turning thing, that's, a, that's really a SIDS thing. And so if, if you've put your baby down on its back and it's managed to get onto its front, if it's capable of getting back again, you don't need to turn it, but it's probably gonna be, you know, four or five months before it's capable of starting to do that. Um, so you might turn it for the first couple of times while it's still learning how to get onto its back. But once it can find its own position front or back, you can leave it where it is. Um, yeah. So we have another question here about pets. When is, what age is safe to have a cat sleep in the same room as a dog person myself, oh, secret given away there, dogs <laughs> as well. Is there anything about pets? I can't think of a case control study that's looked at SIDS and animals specifically. People sort of lump pets and other children into the same category in terms of, you know, should, should the baby be kept away from, from other sleeping children and, and, and sleeping animals at night um, because they have less awareness of, you know, whether they're lying across the baby or not. Um, so I don't think there's an answer to at what age can a baby sleep in a room with a cat. Um, so there's not the data on that. Is there any data about the daytime? Obviously, we more often have our pets around during the day, but also we're increasingly seeing naps. I mean, even I'm napping more. <laughs> but there's a lot of questions here about daytime sleeping. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple, let me just summarize this a minute. Get, try and get these in with our limited time today. Um, is there a biological expectation of the length of a daytime nap? There's one parent here who's also asked about that baby only sleeps for about 25 minutes at a time um, during the day. Is there like something about daytime? Is there different practices at day to night? And are these kind of timelines of 25, 30 minutes problematic or not? So some of, the, some of the stuff that you will read about this that is kind of written from a, an infant cognitive development perspective says yes, that you, know, you have to have a certain amount of sleep to go through certain um, stages of sleep and that you've got to get to a certain stage of sleep for it to be valuable. Um, from a, a biological point of view, as in um, just the baby's physiology and normal development, then no, it doesn't make any difference. Um, I, I don't think my personal feeling is that if the baby is getting enough sleep at night for its own sleep needs and every, remember that every baby's sleep needs are different. Some, you know, there, there's a huge range of variation in the first year. Um, so long as the baby is happy and alert during the day, then it's not sleep deprived. It's not suffering from too little sleep. Um, so, so naps during the day might be quite short and if we think about how sleep pressure works, and I, you know, a lot of people haven't heard of the concept of sleep pressure, but sleep pressure is that sensation, that feeling that you get towards the end of the day that you need to go to sleep soon. And if you don't go and lie down, you're just gonna fall asleep wherever you are. So our sleep pressure builds, it, it falls overnight, and then it kind of gradually builds towards the evening. And sometimes when you come in from work, if you sit down on the couch and you shut your eyes, you think I could just fall asleep now and you'd fall asleep <laughs> at night, but you don't, you kind of get up and you make your dinner um, and you keep that sleep pressure rising. And if the sleep pressure is really high when you go to bed, you should be able to just put your head down on the pillow and be asleep in five minutes. 
Sometimes anxiety and other things get in the way and block sleep pressure. But for babies, sleep pressure builds much more quickly. And it's a chemical in the brain that builds up that we have to kind of clear during when we're sleeping. So babies' sleep pressure builds up in you know two or three hours and then they need to sleep to drop it back down again and then they can have another awake bout. If a baby takes a big long nap in the middle of the day, it drops its sleep pressure all the way back down to zero and then it has to start increasing again. If it takes a short nap, which just takes the edge off the sleep pressure but doesn't completely drop it all the way back down to zero, then the next time its sleep pressure rises, it'll be starting from a higher baseline and it take another nap take another nap and then when it gets to nighttime its sleep pressure is really high so it'll take a bigger longer sleep so parents can use that if they can figure out how to kind of work with just short naps during the day and taking the edge off the sleep pressure you can use that to kind of help your baby take a longer bout of sleep for the first sleep of the night which might be to your advantage if you can get a good bit of sleep in them too so it's something that it's worth thinking about. Big naps during the day mean less sleep during the night because the to you've got to add up the total 24 hour sleep needs. So um, are there things that you can do during the day that encourage sleep at night? Somebody here has asked about baby carrier usage. Another person has been talk talking about um, when babies do need to sleep, to, to sleep longer at night because they're working and things like that, what can they do? So I would say um, anything that engages your baby's brain with what's going on around it will build up sleep pressure. So um, if you want your baby to sleep longer at night, get it outside, observing the, the world around it. There's so much for babies to look at. One of the things that happens in Western societies is that our babies are inside white boxes and oftentimes just staring at a white surface, which is the ceiling, which is really boring. Um, and they're not, you know, there's nothing happening to stimulate their brains. So the easiest way to stimulate their brains is to take them outside. There's so much going on that they can look at and see. So put them in a carrier and let them just observe the world and take them for a walk. Um, that helps to build up sleep pressure. And then think about what you're doing with t in terms of timing of nighttime sleep. So for, you know, a baby in the first year, we have, this is another bit of a cultural obsession that we have in the UK, is that babies have to go to bed about seven o'clock. Um, and, you know, everybody's trying to get their baby down at a certain time. And the question becomes why? Why are we all trying to put our babies to sleep at seven o'clock? Because if you let your baby have another nap about then, and then let it keep right, building up sleep pressure until maybe 10 o'clock when you go to bed its longest sleep period is going to be happening at the same time you're having a nice long bout of sleep and then when it wakes up for the first time it's not going to be just when you're in your deepest phase of sleep it's going to be when you're starting to come out of deeper sleep and into those kind of REM cycles towards the end of sleep and that is a lot easier to deal with than to be woken up from your deepest sleep so it's, it's, you know, we, we could be thinking about this somewhat differently. I know people say that they've, they've got to have that unwinding time in the evening and get the baby to sleep so that they can have some adult time and all the rest of it, but you're trading that off for the best sleep period. So it's, it's your choice what you want to do, but you might want to think about putting the baby uh, to bed a bit later so that you can get make maximize the sleep time if the sleep time is what you're in need of so does that make sense it does make a lot of sense <laughs> i i have i have to say i am one of the worst parents to ask you all these things i had a nicu baby who just slept really well generally and it's only now he's slightly older that he's stopped being <laughs> So I am asking some of these um, on behalf of others. One of the questions that has kind of come up time and time again is about um, what is realistic for an age zone where kids will sleep through the night. I have a older boy who still seems to wake me up early, early in the morning. Um, but what is a realistic age? 
is there one is it just so variable you're not comfortable saying what what is we're really attached to the sleep through the night would mm -hmm. you comment a bit more on it yeah I, I think you know what I'm gonna say that that sleep needs are really variable and, and there isn't one age where you know that's gonna happen um I think a lot of I don't know how old your child is uh Sarah Mine's older now, but we've okay. got one. Georgia also asked some questions and we've had questions from the audience. So we've got a diverse set of parents and caregivers here who have really different experiences. And we had a bit of a laugh in coming up to this because dear Georgia has said that hers slept through the night for the first time really well last night before this talk, acting mm -hmm. as a total shock to all of us while she's been sleep deprived for weeks. Whereas my wonderful son, who's been settled into great sleep for ages, seems to have suddenly started waking up at the sparrow's hour. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> suddenly. I, um, well, I, I think a lot of young kids, um, probably before they go to school, um, do get into a habit of waking up really early. Um, and that might be in part due to the fact that their, their bedtimes are early as well, you know, and, and they've just, they've just accomplished all the sleep that they need by about three o'clock in the morning. So one solution to that is to push their bedtime back a little bit until they're sleeping longer. And then, you know, people sometimes do this thing that they call bedtime fading, which is push their bedtime way back, get them to be sleeping to the place where you want them to, and then gradually bring their bedtime forward by 15 minutes at a time and, and, and see whether it affects the wake up time. If it starts to affect the wake up time, well, then you've got a choice. You either you do one or the other. You can't have both. Um, but um, where was I going with that? Um, yeah, I think I, I think we see a dramatic change when children go to school because school really, really exhausts them. And a lot of kids are coming in from school and falling straight asleep. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that does change, but then if they do fall asleep in the afternoon, the chances are that they'll wake up early because they've had enough sleep because they had a big afternoon nap. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to balance all of these things. Um, and you think you've just gotten into a routine and you've got it sussed and then something comes along and disrupts it all and kind of knocks it out of whack again, you know, they'll get sick or, you know, something disruptive will happen in the family that, yeah. So it's never, it's never all work. You're never spinning all the plates, you know, the way you would like to be doing. You, all you can do is do your best. So somebody has asked actually, but what happens when it does go really wrong? What happens when you've got it so far out of track? You think, is that damaging the psychological well-being of your child, parent, both of you? Somebody here has like, said like when it's really gone wrong. What does really going wrong look like? So the, the question that they've given here is from your lecture. Mm -hmm. Baby sleep problems are often artifacts of parents' distress rather than something that's abnormal about the baby sleep. What do you consider to be a situation that's gone so far off track that it's damaging psychological well-being? Mm, I think, uh, so there are some papers, I mean, and I, don't, I can't come up with a, I don't think I can come up with a, uh, a real life example for this because I don't treat parents and babies. I, you know, I'm, a, and I'm, a, and a, the, I'm an academic, I yep. research stuff. So in reading research papers, what I have read about are situations where um, anxiety has um, forced mothers to constantly check on their babies at night to the, to, to the ex, extent that they are waking their babies at night by checking on them. So it's kind of that, that it becomes an obsession, the, the need, you know, when, when you can't sleep, and, and oftentimes that is a function of anxiety or depression, when you can't sleep, you're, you're constantly worrying about whether your baby's okay, so you're getting up frequently to go and check on your baby and your checking is disturbing their sleep as well. I suppose that's one of those examples where, you know, it can have detrimental effects for everybody because it can just spiral out of control. Okay, so there's the sort of a bunch of questions about um, other cultures as well. So there's a bunch of people wanting you to kind of wrap up by having a little bit of a discussion about elsewhere. What do we know academically? You've just mentioned you're primarily an academic rather than doing those kind of direct 
on the ground interventions. Can you comment about different cultural um, attitudes and different approaches? So um, I suppose the, a lot of cultural research um, has looked at places like um, Japan um, and other Asian countries where, um, you know, sleeping arrangements are a lot different than they are in the UK. So parents typically sleep with their babies. It's normal, you, you know, it's what you do. You have a baby and you bring it into bed with you. Um, and sleep with it, you know, for, for maybe the first year or maybe the first couple of years. Um, in other sort of non-Westernized, non non-industrialized, I suppose, countries um, look at Western practices, and it, actually not just non-Western non countries. I mean, there's a very famous paper about um, um, the Maya in Central America and Mexico who um, express, concern for the welfare for babies in America because they feel as though leaving babies to sleep in a cot for eight hours at night is neglect. Um, but I've also seen similar sentiments expressed in research in Italy um, where, you know, children often stay up with their parents until late in the evening, which we in the UK look at with horror, you know, why are children out socializing with their parents until 10 or 11 o'clock at night? But to those Italian parents, you know, putting those babies to sleep um, early in the evening and then leaving them is, you know, a, a, a poor parenting practice. So they see what we do negatively as well. So I think this is true, you know, in lots of places where people have got different attitudes to children. And in the 1920s and 30s, there was a kind of a there was a, an, a movement in the UK and in, in the States and, and other Western European countries towards what they called scientific baby care. And it was when there were a lot of psychologists and clinicians sort of getting into the space of child rearing and starting to tell parents what they should be doing based on the newly emerging science um, of behaviorism. Um, so the, you know, the, the whole thing about training rats to press buttons and get food is behaviorism and operant conditioning. And they were applying all of that to, um, to teaching children about how to behave as adults and, and how to be seen and not heard and how to be quiet and, you know, all sorts of things that, that were considered proper behavior for children. And a lot of the ideas about sleep came in that we have now kind of were promoted around that era and they've never left. Um, and so if we think historically about what we used to do prior to the, the um, mid 1800s, that was very much more similar to what many other cultures are doing contemporaneously. Um, and the way in which our practices changed in the 1920s and 30s um, was a was a particularly um, unusual cultural kind of phenomenon. Okay, and um, so one of the questions that's there is with that diversity of understanding and with all these questions and things outstanding, what are you researching next? <laughs> oh, is there a spoiler? <laughs> lots of things. Um, so our, our current biggest project is about supporting parents. Um, when they're struggling so it's it's we, we've devised an intervention which is drawn on lots of other things um but is is about trying to um help parents think about what their parenting values are so that they understand the decisions that they're why they're making the decisions that they're making and then helping them with um a bit of information about sleep biology but also um some strategies and um, suggestions about things like I've talked about, about whether you want babies to be having big daytime naps, whether you want your baby to be going to bed at you know seven or whether it's more beneficial to be leaving their bedtime a little bit later and all of these kinds of things. Um, and having some kind of support groups for parents who are, who are grappling with all of these issues and decisions and babies who are kind of you know, not, conf not, not following the book, not conforming to um, what culture expects. 
um, to try and change really to uh, what, what we talked about, what I talked about in the talk, to try and change the conversation that people are having around baby sleep. So what I'd like to do is an intervention trial to test this program and see whether people find it helpful. Um, but to do that, of course, we've got to get whopping great wadges of money out of some funding agency who thinks that it's worth us doing this. So um, watch this space and we'll find out whether we do. And before we go, because I know there's a number of questions that we didn't quite get to about all manner of things like swaddling and the like, I know you have some great resources. We are going to put up the recording of this Q&A along with the flag back to your past lecture during the week. So those who attended will be able to watch. Those of you who are watching us retrospectively, thank you for joining us. Um, but Helen, of course, has a number of resources. Do you want to flag where they are to people right now or anything you'd want them to particularly look at? Yes. So please go and have a look at our website, which is the Baby Sleep Information Source. So the um, URL is www.basisonline.org.uk. And everything that I've talked about, we try to kind of encapsulate in um, information that's on that site. So if there's research being done about it, it should be there. If it's not there, it's most likely because there's no research being done for us to be able to say anything. So we try to make it evidence-based as possible. But you're welcome to you know, email us with a question. All we can say is, sorry, there isn't any research to inform that question. Um, and then we have a conference coming up in April where uh, some of the research team from the Infancy and Sleep Center will be talking about their latest studies. So I'll be hosting that. Um, and that is on the 21st of April between 1 and 4 p.m. And you can find more information about that on our center website, which is www.durham.ac.uk backslash DISC, D-I-S-C for Durham Infancy and Sleep Center. And we'll put Thank all you. the links in the down below when we load this to the internet and put that it is. online. So you will be able to get these addresses for those who weren't quick enough to get it down right now, don't panic. We will be loading the video. It may not be straight away because of course we're all in lockdown and as you've probably gleaned, we do have children. Um, so we will be with you this week with getting it online. Thank you so much, Professor Ball, for joining us and for answering all these questions. You're welcome. To wrap up, I want to give you the opportunity to give one short takeaway. If you had one thing you could just impart on everybody, what would it be? Don't listen to what everybody tells you about your baby's sleep. Listen to your baby. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's really appreciated. For those of you who did join us and want to come to some of our other events, we will follow up with links to the events during the week, including some on adult sleep and what we know and what the evidence is around those of us who are currently sleep deprived um, <laughs> about what we can do. We'll be emailing you after this event with a brief survey and links to those other events if you wish to join us. Thank you so much to the audience and for all your wonderful questions today. And thank you once again, Professor Ball. Thank you for having me.